Hey guys, how you doing? Welcome to the Mindful Space. My name is Tyler. I'm here with my co-host Johnny. What up, what up? Uh, today's gonna be a really, really, really good one. Um, our producer, Alex, um, recommended this guy. He knows him for a really long time. Uh, he has a really powerful story. He's been through a lot, a lot of stuff. Um, you know, you see the food here. Uh, this is his business. Um, you know, it's delicious. Johnny likes the spicy one, as he said 15 times. But uh, I'm gonna introduce you guys to Sarge. How's everybody doing? Thank What's you up, for coming. Brother? Thank you. Thank you yeah, for having me. Absolutely. Yeah, we're really excited about this one. Yeah. I mean, I had to, I had to stop the conversation because it was <laughs> started getting It was there. too good. It was <laughs> stuff that, that people probably want to hear. Um, yeah, so I guess, wh where do, where do you want to start? You know, how, how, when did you come over, come over here? Let's do a little background and just, you know, whatever you feel is important. Mm -hmm. We came in to the U.S. in uh, 87. Nine, yeah, 87, 1987. And uh, I was 15 days, 15 years, four days. Uh, with the family? With the family. My dad was working for uh, the Israeli government at the time. And uh, my mom uh, was a banker. They decided to leave Israel and uh, stay in the U.S. My dad was uh, pretty much in New York, Virginia area. Uh, my mom was... Uh, we were we started in New York, then we went back to we came back down to uh, Florida to stay with uh, the rest of the family. Uh, I went to high school over here, um, and uh, at the age of uh, nineteen and a half, a year and a half after high school and a little bit of college, I went back and I uh, served in uh, the IDF to fulfill my national uh, duty. Yeah, explain that to people that don't know you. In Israel, every male is obligated to serve three years. Every female is obligated to serve 18 months. Within the 18 months, wow. uh, you have the opportunity to acquire job skills. Uh, they're, just like over here, we have the ASVAB. Mm -hmm. uh, in high school, they're giving you a lot of uh, tests to, to filter people who wish to be pilots, but they don't have the capability of being pilots and people who wish to be uh, in combat but don't have the physical ability to uh, match uh, combat intensity or specialized units. Uh, everybody has a job in Israel. Yeah, you can be uh, handicapped and they will find you a job uh, in the military. Wow. Uh, it's good for the simple fact that the military will have some sort of a baseline of uh, whether or not in the future you need you are eligible to carry firearms in Israel. Uh, people who want to be drivers, for example, uh, have the opportunity to be in a in a, in a corps to drive. You know, colonels drive uh, uh, commanders. Um, I just uh, I became uh, uh, army uh, infantry attached to uh, an airborne uh, base at the border of Hebron and uh, which is the West Bank and uh, Israel. What was going on back then? I guess what was the, what was the, in the nineties you had uh, the Gulf war obviously started uh, already started. Uh, you have the, I think it's the second intifada uh, between Israel and uh, the Palestinians which is, again, for us, it's a period in time. In Israel, it's a way of life. Mm -hmm. The average Palestinian, the average Israeli just want to coexist. But when you start throwing extremists from both sides, mm -hmm. uh, you have, uh, it's a recipe for, it's like a Molotov cocktail. It's, it's just a matter of time. Especially in that close proximity. Close yeah. proximity. Uh, uh, our job at that base was when people are crossing into Israel, you do the background check, you're filtering them, you make sure that they are uh, not hostile or mm -hmm. they're on no, no, nobody's list. Uh, my job on a, bit, on a base was to examine uh, uh, explosives and ammunition. And again, guard duties are part of that. Mm -hmm. Shit. Yeah, it is. It was a hot zone, yeah. It yeah. was, yeah, it, it was, it, it's definitely you can't just sit there on a sunny day and tan mm -hmm. within the walls of the base. Yeah. Right. You're on your toes all the time. Especially with a religious conflict. 
you know, and, and that's, that's what it comes and, down and to, that's right? What it's it comes a religious down. conflict. Religious conflict. It's who has the right to exist. With extremists, know? with the extremist component, a lot of it too, right? Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it, 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 there is there, there is something that you want and something that I have. And if I don't will, if I'm not willing to give it back to you or mm-hmm. give it to you, uh, when it comes to needs, sometimes you're going to fight for it. And that yeah. goes both sides. This one wants peace. In coexistence this one wants the whole land we're not going to get into the yeah yeah right of course. About it, yeah but it, it was it, it it's tense to say the least you know i did my military uh service over there i uh returned to the states and you know i worked for a great guy by the name of wayne heisenga oh. uh for, for a year at uh you know who that is no you know the dolphins for a long I mean, yeah. block, blockbuster music, blockbuster music, oh, blockbuster really? video, sanitation, okay. right? Sanitation, um, waste management. That's like a Florida boy thing. That's why you. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. On the Marlins. Wow. On the Mar. Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, um, I worked for Alamo, which is a division that he had, mm-hmm. uh, rental car, and then Auto Nation. And eventually, I decided that being in the office is not for me. Mm-hmm. And I and look, I, I got accepted through law school, and and I wasn't. I, I was a great student. But I never saw myself in a courtroom setting. Yeah. You know, it's just not me. I, mm-hmm. I was too, it was too full. I wanted to, I wanted a career that was, was going to be fulfilling right. and exciting. And I wanted a career that gives back to a country that gave me the most, gave me education, gave me stability, gave me safety, uh, living, mm-hmm. uh, uh, food on the table from being uh uh, my dad and my mom opening up the the, the bakery, and uh, I decided uh, that I want to be a cop. I remember when we landed, I landed with my sister in JFK, and back then, you know, you had to put the coins in uh, in the soda machine, mm-hmm. yeah. and she was too short. She was a shortstop, you know, so she was trying to put the coin. She couldn't get there, and 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 a big black, you know, uh, officer sergeant was in the in the airport, lift her up. From NY, from uh, whatever transportation over there, and she, he helped her put the twenty five, thirty five cents in a uh, in a machine. So I thought it was like that's a hero for me. It's like my my little sister. Yeah. yeah. Boom. That's, uh, that's so cool. That for me, that's 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 what yeah. I want. Now, in Israel, my dad's brother, my uncle, was high up in the Israeli police. So I figured the lineage is there. It's a job that will give you a lot of opportunities. Obviously, law enforcement is, for me, one of the greatest uh, positions you can have as a civil civil servant. And um, I filled up two applications. It was Broward Sheriff's Office, and it was the Sunrise Police Department. And before I know it, Sunrise uh, pushed everything through. I do speak several languages, Hebrew, uh, Spanish and Arabic is one of them. Oh. So it's a little bit of English. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Doing good. That's so, funny. Yeah, they tell me I speak Hebronics. It's half Hebrew, Hebronics. half English. So, yeah. um, Where did the Arabic come in? Was that just Israel, from, Israel. from in being Israel, in Israel? Se- third grade, they teach you, introduce you to a second language. Okay. And on fifth grade, you're picking up your third language. So it can be English or French. Uh, oh. But Arabic, because of the coexistence, because right. of... It was good for when you are at the border. Correct. Yeah. Um, got a lot of use of it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And um, the rest is history. You know, I, I, I went to the academy and I had fun. And You have to have a college degree to go to be a cop? Or, you know. yeah. When I got hired, you needed a high school diploma, clean driving record, and uh, obviously a U.S. citizenship. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think the standards are the same by the state. However, the competition out there between people who having high school diploma, people who having four year degree in criminal justice or civil engineering, and then you have people that have that plus mm-hmm. four years, five years of military or military background. Uh, competition out there is, is vast. Yeah. So if you just have a high school diploma, technically, yeah, you can get hired, mm. but. There are so many other people vying for the same position mm-hmm. that have. You're going to get skipped over, yeah. Correct. There's other options. And obviously, veteran preferences mm-hmm. always going to surpass somebody who 
is absolutely just, you know now was anything different for you in the academy being that you had a military background from another country like were you fast tracked in any way or no, maybe no absolutely not in a matter okay. of fact it humbles you because rules of, enga of engagement in the military completely different mm -hmm. than your rules of engagement within the civil and civilian uh, world uh police work is a paramilitary organization mm -hmm. that you're going to have uh, a lot of parallels between uh, uh, police work and law enforcement work. However, your SOPs, your standard operating procedures mm -hmm. and your uh, policy and procedure books are completely different yeah. than um, military. Okay. In the academy, no, I wasn't fast tracked. As a matter of fact, I thought I knew everything, but mm -hmm. I knew nothing. And it's humbling. It's yeah, humbling yeah. because it's it. Yeah, it's, you expected to have an edge and you didn't. And I, I didn't. Yeah. I mean, it's one. So there were a plethora of reasons I didn't become a cop, but it mm -hmm. was like some, everyone kept saying, become a cop. You know, when I got, I did eight years in the Marine Corps. And um, I was like, fuck that. Like, I don't want to start over. Like, mm -hmm. you know, like we call them boots. Like when you're yeah. a, a private, and I'm like, I'm not going to go back to being a boot. Mm -hmm. And I joined the Marine Corps at 25. So when I got out after eight years, I was 32, 33 years old. No There's way. no way I'm going to yeah. let some 25 year old sergeant boss me around. Yeah. Get fucked. You yeah. know what I mean? That was my mentality. And I'll tell you, that's the only curve myself and my one of my best friends is is a well, is a you know retired marine. Yeah, There's no former right. marine, but sure. uh, but Rob and I were sitting right next to each other, and the only curve that military guys had over people who are fresh off college or fresh off the street is the fact that you know how to keep your mouth shut. Mm -hmm. Right. It's, you're gonna oh, yeah. get. You're gonna get. Listen, <laughs> yeah. listen. The first week, it's like uh, Vidal. Where are you? Uh, right over there. Oh, you're uh, you're breathing wrong. Drop. Give me twenty five. Right. There is nothing else you can do to mitigate that. Mm -hmm. You're right. gonna get your. They're gonna try to break you to build sure. you. Only they don't have to break me. I know exactly my my spot, yeah. and that's usually what yeah. military guys, um, are. You know, they, they, that's the curve they have. Mm -hmm. Right. Do your mouth shot. Do your work. You know, yeah, been, you did been, less push-ups than everybody else. <laughs> been there, done. Yeah. Been done. <laughs> Johnny did all the push-ups. <laughs> I, I was, I, got, I was in trouble from the day I stepped into the Marine Corps. Really? But I also excelled, you know, because it's just like we do, right? We, you know, work hard, play hard. Mm -hmm. Um, and it, it saved my ass because I, I used to get NJP, non-judicial punishments. Um, I mean, I got two DUIs in the Marine Corps. I, I failed on base, ass. right? Yeah, mm -hmm. going into base, I went on the base, I got a, a DUI. Um, but like my my service jacket, right? My record said that, you know, I did a lot of really good things as well, especially when I was overseas. Mm -hmm. Like I, you know, and so thank God for that because towards the end of my, my Marine Corps career, you know, about seven, seven and a half years in, uh, I, we'd already made a decision to get out and uh, I like failed a drug test. I mean, I, my life was going just, you know, my sense of purpose has gone away and I was, uh, I was really struggling to, to kind of keep afloat. And the drinking and drugging got a lot, you know, you, you can only control for so long yeah. um, to where I failed a drug test. And the only thing that saved my ass, you know, after all those, that eight years of two deployments, you know, countless, you know, different awards and shit like that, that saved me from getting a dishonorable discharge. So many of my buddies have been kicked out for the same really? type of shit because they didn't have a colonel who actually looked at me and looked at my path, you know, didn't just judge me for what I was at, mm -hmm. right at that moment. He judged me for like kind of what had happened. Uh, and he gave me, yeah, I was still able to get my honorable discharge. Thank God. Yeah. You got lucky. Um, yeah. Oh, I got extremely lucky. It's heartbreaking. It's, it's, it's devastating to any of us who yeah. are first of all in the military and then in civil war when you screw up, you fuck up. And usually fuck ups are not small, fuck -ups, mm -hmm. are major. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you're faced in losing your life, yeah. lifelong work. And it's not just people saying, oh, yeah, you look afraid of losing your pension. It's not that. It's your identity. Mm -hmm. your, your, what am I doing now? I'm like, I can't even say I did this because it's, it's, it's mirrored. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so I, I, like yourself, I found myself, you know, surrounded with the majority of the people I, I was surrounded with. Was, where they were looking for my best interest latter part of my career rather than looking to punish me. Yeah. But again, all you have to do is to fall on the wrong group of people right. that yeah. want to prove a point and then 
your hard work will go in a waste. Yeah. 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 It's, um, you know, I'll, I'll kind of get into what you, we were talking about off camera. And that's what I, when I kind of said, like, let's, let's, oh, yeah, let, yeah, let's <laughs> let that, yeah, like, let that, let's let that marinate for a little bit is, is what you said. You made a comment and I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it was to the effect of, um, that alcohol was saving you. Correct. So let's get that, into, let's get into, yeah, so explain into the elephant in the room. Yeah. Uh, so the first year, you know, <clears throat> out of the academy, you just do, you do work, you do grunt work, you do uh, uh, street work. You basically don't have any say of where you're being positioned, what shift. They want you to experience everything and anything. And I say to all the recruits that are coming out of the academy, you will see in your first six months to a year stuff that a normal person, a normal person won't right. see in a lifetime. And it's how you digest. Um, I got lucky. I had a really good arrest that developed fantastic uh, information that got the FBI and the DEA involved and uh, Secret Service. And they asked my chief to take me on a loan to, uh, to work on a case that was led by the DEA. That's how I was introduced to my uh, vice and narcotics uh, career as a detective. Uh, beginning, I was just a task force officer that was at loan, and I was working the road and that. But again, didn't have kids. I wasn't married. I, I didn't care. Money's coming. Mm -hmm. Sleep right. is overrated. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's where, listen, my dad is Italian Jewish. My mom is Hispanic Jewish. So wine on the table was always part of opening up a table. Mm -hmm. It's one of those things. Alcohol was in the house. So I, it's not like at 15, I discovered alcohol or uh, the mite behind the whiskey or anything like that. I it was there. I, I never had the urge to sneak behind my parents' uh, back. But once you are, um, in, even in college, I wasn't like blitzed out of my mind. Right. Um, but once you're starting, you're coming to your new uh, unit. You're coming to your new uh, uh, shift, your new squad. Yeah. Everybody's going to do something together. So you're going to go watch, let's say, Monday night football and have a couple of beers. Mm -hmm. And before you know it, it's Thursday and getting off shift. And let's go grab a couple of uh, drinks. And it becomes a social thing. For me, latter part of my career, I had a whole bunch of triggering incidents which unbeknownst to me since 2007 until the rest of my career, which is almost over 10 years, I was walking a case of severe PTSD, but it was undiagnosed. Mm -hmm. Undiagnosed not because of uh, me avoiding the shrink in a hallway. It's because at that point, I was a sergeant. At that point, I was uh, part of the hostage negotiation, and I led the hostage negotiation team. Wow. Uh, so you have a lot of education. And with education comes power. It, it's how you're using the power. I used it to mask all my red flags. Mm -hmm. So it's not like you, you as my sergeant come to me and say, hey, man, falling sick a couple of times too often, you never done it. Is everything okay? You sure is everything okay? And then we can open up a conversation. I didn't let anybody in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just mm -hmm. nobody in. So I figured, you know what? My wife will never understand, and my kids will never understand what it is to walk into a house and investigate a SIDS case, sudden mm -hmm. infant death injury. I can tell you. To become a good officer, you need to take a normal person with good, good shoulders, a head on their shoulders, and you're going to make it the most pessimistic person in the world because you have to expect the unexpected. You have to expect the deceivement. You have to expect your, your, your clues out there, and you cannot ignore them because I have my version, you have my version, and then the camera will show you mm -hmm. what really happened. Yeah. Um, that was your job as a police officer. So I can tell you that uh, I, I can describe you right now what that baby looks like. And, and it's something that's engraved in your head 
for a long time. So my wife is a teacher. What am I going to tell her? All mm -hmm. the gore stories? I mean, yeah. when you're drinking with the guys, yeah, you can. Of course. You, you can, yeah, man, I saw this or I saw that. I see this guy, that guy. But slowly it's chipped into you. So that doesn't, but when you get to just talk about it amongst buddies, it doesn't, for me, um, it's why I can't go to the VA and go to their, their fucking groups, right? Where it's like everyone's war storying. For one, half of you are lying. And if, if you've been there, you know it. And that makes me more fucking mad. Mm -hmm. Or the guys that have been through it, we could just, it's like talking shop, right? It's just, it's, it doesn't, I'm not really like coming at, you know, it, we're just talking shop. Right. I'm not, I'm not really letting it out or, you know, I'm not getting emotional over it. I'm just back to, con it's back to that situation. You and recall I, and you put it back. Yeah. And, and what you are saying for me was um, when I went overseas, I had to numb myself. You know, I had to, I had to, and I, I talk about it a lot, the, the switch of emotions was flipped off. Because when I'm picking up a man, I swept for IEDs, right? And uh, I mean, I'll say Lance Corporal Wilson is dying over here, right? He's, he sat down on a, on a pressure plate. I, had, I couldn't, because I had a mission to do, and I, did, I had guys behind me who were, my sweep, my metal detector was saving their life, right? Keeping them alive. I can't get emotional about this man down here, just like, with a, like you're saying with, a, with right. an infant. Which every, you would think as humans, like an infant is the most cherished, like sweet mm -hmm. thing. But you're you a human being. But you can't look at it like that because you're going to lose, then you're, you're losing um, focus. And the same thing with me with Wilson or, you know, with a couple of other people. Like we had to pick Wilson up in, in his three pieces, put him in the vehicle, in the medevac and keep going. That wasn't a human being anymore. You know what I'm saying? And so... That was my problem when I came home to my wife, right? Or, you know, or, or to my parents or whoever that didn't understand is that I was so emotionally numb to these things and I had no one to talk to that would understand it other than the buddies when we're drinking, getting fucked up, talking about war. But that wasn't doing it either. The biggest gift and the biggest sword, double-edged sword that any warrior has is its ability to contain itself. Because you are mission focused. Whether it's sweeping for IED and now you're looking at your buddy, child body as an object and versus, you know, going to a, a community meeting, you have to be mission focused or it's wasted time, it's wasted efforts. Missions and, and statements don't go where they're supposed to go. And yes, because of the fact that I didn't believe that I should subject my wife to this and she won't understand. And probably she will not understand today. Mm. Uh, I kept it in. But when you're keeping it in, you're losing a little bit of yourself because you are numbing part of, at least for myself, I was numbing part of my memory. I just didn't mm -hmm. want to deal with it. But I can tell you that the grass was freshly cut that evening. Yeah. And, 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 and that's the sad part. You're associating stuff later on with your visions of unpleasantness. Something that everybody is like, oh my God, I'm taking a walk. Fresh right. grass, you know. For me, for a long time, it was, I oh man, let me go inside and now you have to calm yourself down. So the easiest way to calm yourself down without going to a doctor and saying, let me have a couple of beers. So cutting the grass for me because it was mission specific, cutting the grass in my own house required 12 to 24 beers. Mm -hmm. I'm not a big guy, you know. I, I 12 beers will put you in a, in a right spot. <laughs> right. 24 beers, yeah. you know, putting you in, in a completely different spot. Yeah, in a different world. Correct. So it started with that. And then you're having a bad day at work because you have external and internal pressures. And, and now you either want to go with your friends to have a couple of drinks. And then when they leave, you just button back and you have a couple <laughs> more drinks before you're getting home. Mm -hmm. Or you're going to go into, in my case, the garage. And I had beers over there. I had my, my I, I can tell you everything about Scott you want to you mm -hmm. know. And that was, my, that was my thing. So it started from having one to two shots in the garage to polishing a full bottle. 
and then wondering why I didn't buy two. Mm -hmm. um, and that's while I was working, you know, not on the job, but on my days off. Right. I would go back to work and I would be the most functioning, high productive individual. Mm -hmm. At one point, I was in charge of the entire fleet of vehicle buying and selling, uh, the uh, field training office, uh, community outreach, and street crime, uh, road patrol duties, and hostage negotiation. The, wow. That is a lot of projects. And it's I wanted a lot them, of hats to wear. Yeah. It, I wanted that pressure because I said, I need to be busy. I'm better off looking for the IEDs than sitting and thinking about everything else mm -hmm. so from social drinking and don't forget when you're moving from your your squad to a new uh detective squad to a new task force you're gonna bond all over again and mm -hmm. and i remember uh, i remember uh when i when i started you know i had a uh, funny irish um lieutenant and he says to me yo vidal you drinking and I says, ah, you know, only, you know, only beer. And he goes, I don't trust people. Yeah. You know, today I'll tell you, I don't trust myself, right. mm -hmm. which is a completely 180. Right. But there is a long way in between to yeah. where, you know, that, you know, that maturity came yeah, from. Yeah, you didn't just get there overnight. Oh, no. Oh, yeah. no. And the road was ugly. And the end of mm -hmm. the, my, the end of the, of the road was, um, was miserable. Yeah. It was miserable. Felt. Drinking started taking over my life. It's no longer a therapeutic. It's supposed to be just to take off the edge. Now it became the edge. Yeah. And now without it, I cannot get to mm -hmm. the edge. Right. And that's where the digression, your, 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 your regress mm -hmm. starts. Um, and then I was doing stuff mentally. I wasn't there. I was tired of being tired. I was tired of fighting that, that whirlpool. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's like, it's a never ending spiral that, yep. you know, it, it, it's, it's swallowing you. It, it's now you start planning dinners with your family at restaurants where there's an open bar. So, okay. It's Friday night. It's going to be a 45 minutes wait. Okay. We're going to go to that restaurant because I can grab a couple of drinks while we all waiting outside. By the time I'm going to sit down, I'm four or five in, you know, Dinner is going to be a little bit more easy mm -hmm. or yeah. easy to deal with the family, which shouldn't be that. Yeah. Right. Um, you had a pregame. You had to, you had to oh, get there. Abs absolutely. You had to pregame. Yeah. And then you have, you know, to pregame inside your house. So, mm -hmm. okay, if I'm going to be in a garage, I need to have that stash over there. And then if I'm going to be in, you know, the backyard smoking a cigar, I need to have a stash right there. And when you promise everybody, okay, I'm going to cut down. You need to start yeah. hiding it, mm -hmm. right? you know, so you usually don't drive yeah. my car. So it used to be in the trunk of my car. Mm -hmm. And, and before you know it, you know, before you reaching home, you're stopping at parking lot, having a couple of shots and then you're getting home and then you're telling, you know, family, Hey, I'm going to take my uniform off and I'm going to sit home and I'm going to have uh, a drink, um, for a year. Before I retired, before I got actually diagnosed with PTSD, I refused to take my patrol car home because I knew it would be a violation of policy to have an open container anywhere within the vehicle. So I used to drive my personal vehicle to the PD, park it, and then drive my personal vehicle back home. Well, yeah, because in so, Florida, most <clears throat> cops take their patrol car home. Correct. Right? We see it all the time. Correct. Wow. Take home program. It's, yeah. It benefits. And that wasn't a red flag for anybody like on the force. They weren't looking at you like, why? No, because I, because people tell me, why, why are you driving your the POV? And yeah. I said, uh, I don't want the neighbors, you know, like, yeah, makes sense. You know, there's always, if, if you've been around, there's always ways to mask, mm -hmm. you know, a reason, uh, why you, Hey, you like, you're okay. You know, stars, you okay. You missed like two days out of four day week. But yeah. You know, I just, kids are in a, in, in. Kids are in uh, in daycare, and I got a stomach bug, yeah. stu bug stomach yeah. bug, and I'm throwing up. Well, I'm throwing up because I I polished one and a half bottles <laughs> of, of scotch. Yeah, not because mm -hmm. of anything else. Yeah, now it's hard to get the and morning I, one down. Yeah, correct. So, uh, in 2013, all the pressure mounted up to me having 
a heart attack in my patrol car. So March 13th, 2013, flying my patrol car, couldn't breathe, got to the fire station, drove myself to the fire station, charged over having cardiac arrest, and we are rushing into the hospital. Um, June, three months later, I was back to regular duty, and my mom passes away. So the only person that I actually opened up and knew I can go have a slice of bread and mm -hmm. some good stuff and comfort was my mom. And my dad is a military guy. So as much as I love my dad, my dad is still task oriented. Mm -hmm. At 80 years old, he will be at the bakery in the morning and it's his way. And yeah, yeah. my father's I, the same exact I, I, way. And I yeah. have to respect it. It's worked for him. Yeah. So I had a heart attack and they asked me, is there any stresses within that you think that you are experiencing that can cause elevated blood pressure or no, I, I worked out regularly. I ate pretty decent. Yeah. Uh, there is no history of heart attacks within my family. So they immediately said it's the heart bill, which is a Florida state statue and for first responders and my recovery and my long-term, uh, Care is being handled by the state. Well, 2017, drinking is becoming uncontrollable. Um, I I do stuff. So, what was the next four years like? Just same shit. Same Back shit. to the same shit. Mm -hmm. Same shit. Yeah. He, trying to, it was a full time job. To keep yeah. All the demons inside. Mm -hmm. All the all the tattletale signs of drinking inside my uniforms were always crisp my police car was always clean my desk was always up to enough there is no you know backlog of mm -hmm. reports and I, I was at work i was the most productive individual yeah. you will see right. i was failing miserably at home yeah. you know, <laughs> pushing my wife away mm -hmm. i wanted to die mm -hmm. so i stopped wearing my Wow. Yeah. I I start driving around with my gun belt on my side. And there when there was nothing, I would go to a parking parking lot and take my stuff out and listen to the radio and be reactive. I was trying not to contribute to the stress that because I know that at that point I need to go home to fix it. Right. And the only way to fix it is for me to have a couple of drinks. And it was perfect because I was working midnight. Mm -hmm. So everybody was out of the house in the morning. So all I had to do is drop the kids at school and one kid at school. The other kid was going with my wife to her school. Mm -hmm. And then she's picking both of them up. I, I'm Gucci. Yeah. You know, there is no, there's, yeah. there's my land. So mm -hmm. you put the dog away, you're feeding them and you, you're on your own. Um, yeah. You had it down to a science at that point. You, you have to. Yeah. You, it is a full-time job. Mm -hmm. Being an alcoholic and being a functional alcoholic, it's probably the toughest job I have ever yeah. had. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it was the same I for left, me as I, a heroin I, um, addict. Yeah. yeah. I, it was so tough. I, I, I got tired of juggling and hiding, and I just left the house. Because I didn't think, like, if I was going to stay in the house, I had to stop. And there was, I, I had no solution. So there was no way I was stopping. Mm -hmm. Like 2007, mm -hmm. I had an incident where uh, attempted murder suspect, active uh, perimeter. I observed the suspect going down the street. My my backup, which was another sergeant, was a little bit ahead of me. So I called out the description. So by the time he made a turn, I already confronted the suspect. Struggle ensued. We were fighting over my gun, um, snatched my radio thinking it was my gun and, and then hit me with the radio. Um, yeah, I got hit with, <laughs> with my own radio. <laughs> but at that point, concussion starts giving you the effect and, mm -hmm. and you start stumbling and you're fighting with, with somebody over the gun. I, I disengaged somehow. I, and I remember trying to lift that gun. It was like, was the, the heaviest thing I've ever held. Uh, eventually, 
the eventually the my partner came back and backup arrived suspect was taken into custody and where i started i passed out i walked to my car because that's your training is go back to your car mm -hmm. and um i passed out by my front uh tires of my uh, crown vic um went to the hospital you know i, I insisted to go back home obviously you're on light duty at that point because concussion is mm -hmm. you can't go back on until I see a neurologist. And I remember I came home at like 3.30 in the morning and the way my wife found out about it, she was watching, I think it was like Desperate Housewives or some, something on TV and breaking news, you know, they were filming the break-in, uh, home invasion robbery where my incident happened literally 300 yards down from them. So all they had to do is to yeah, hand the camera, the camera and then you see me on, my, on the floor and... That's how she found out. Then she received wow. a phone call from my partner. Hey, listen, he's in a he's going to the hospital, but he's okay. Mm -hmm. uh, I got home and and I remember being mad that it happened to me. First of all, it's embarrassing. Second of all, uh, I knew that I'm gonna hear about mm -hmm. everything, and I knew my mom is not gonna be happy, my dad is not gonna be happy, and above all, my wife. But in three o'clock in the morning, three thirty in the morning, instead of being a rational, rational person and and just do your, uh, I'm okay. Let me go to sleep. We'll talk about it tomorrow. I got into an all-out shouting match with my uh, fight with my wife, not by her doing, by me doing. Because I asked her a simple question: Do you know where my life insurance policy is at? And she said, I don't. And at three thirty in the morning. Ask me today, where's my wife? Yeah. I, I don't know. It's probably in the state. Mm -hmm. You know, but she wasn't, that wasn't her focus. Her focus right. is like her husband yeah. is yeah. literally came inches close from getting into a shootout. Mm -hmm. and yeah, she thought you almost died. Plus, her emotional roller coaster mm -hmm. that I completely discounted. Um, that was when the forensic pathologist, psychologist, uh, later on started analyzing. That was. The triggering event. Then there was in 2008, 2009, a couple of small injuries. Then in 2013, I had my heart attack and then other small incidents. Again, no behavioral issues, no nothing. I wanted to push everybody away. Mm -hmm. I was better off at that period of time that I'm all by myself. It was safer that way. Safer for me. Yeah. It was safer for them. Yeah. Nobody has to walk into mm -hmm. So. My kids got the brunt of things by me being just mean and zero tolerance dad 24 seven. And like, you know, you cannot be a Marine at home. Right. We can help you, but right. it, it's not working all nah, the time. Nah, hell no. Nah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I got a daughter, bro. Yeah. And, 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 <laughs> Plus my, my daughter will tell me to fuck myself. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I know what you mean. But my, yeah, my boys becoming, became a little bit more, yeah. you know, resisting. Yeah. I mean, my oldest, was 13 at a time so my youngest became more of the vocal rebellion mm -hmm. than my oldest um so i started doing stuff that if i'm gonna go out i'm gonna go out via bullet flag mm -hmm. i wanted that not wearing the vest doing traffic stops not calling every traffic stop yeah. out until after I stopped the car. Wow. Um, barricaded subjects, you know, get as close as you can, maybe to, to be the hero. Stuff that subconsciously I wanted. If it happens, it happens. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I worth more dead than alive. When that didn't work, I need to start pushing my wife away and my family away. Yeah. And um, without getting into it, I committed the biggest cardinal sin in a relationship. Mm -hmm. Sure. And uh, I told her too. Wow. I'm like, run, please run. Yeah. And I begged her, get away run. from me. Get away from me. Yeah. I'm no good. She was mad. She was mad for a couple of weeks. And she was living in my spare bedroom. And uh, I'm like, okay, listen, I'm going to become another one of the police officers and law enforcement that's getting divorced and married about six million times. Mm -hmm. And everybody's going to get a piece of my pension, yeah. including my kids and my ex wife. Um, she didn't let me think. 
which angered me even more. Mm -hmm. So I went in, I got a hotel room because of the fact that you are playing chemist with mm -hmm. your drinking. Mm -hmm. yeah. I had sleeping pills that I was hoarding for about six months with my class A uniform on. Sat down on a bed, drank a quarter of a bottle, my favorite whiskey, and chugged down about 50 uh, pills. And uh, I was looking at my kid's picture, and I'm like, can't do it. Can't yeah. do it to them. Made myself throw up. Wow. I was woozy. Yeah. I was woozy already, because I don't know if you yeah. know about the ambient, mm -hmm. ambient and alcohol. It's bad mix. Bad mix. Yeah. It's not hallucinating. Yeah. Hotel room was literally around the corner from my house. I got into the house. I stumbled. I fell asleep on the couch in full uniform. And I, my wife told me, I would try to wake you up, but you were sleeping and we figured you didn't have work. I didn't want to do it the day before work. I didn't want to screw anybody at work. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah, that's how screwed up you are. Yeah. Your, your priorities are completely yeah. skewed. You're taking care of the stuff that takes care of you and work was taking care of me mm -hmm. mentally because I was focused on the task I had at, at hand. Yeah, so you had to protect right. that. So I did all this and... We decided to, I didn't tell my wife, but she came to me and she decided, to, hey, listen, we need to go to, we need to move on with this, whether it's repairable or not repairable. I think we need to go to a counselor. But I didn't want to go to a counselor. Mm -hmm. No, no, I mean. No man I'm not, does. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm a man. Mm -hmm. I don't need counseling. I mm -hmm. can tell you, I'm a hostage negotiator. I'm a sergeant. Yeah. Three reasons. One, two, and three. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's. And then I'm like, okay, you're going to lose them. So you go and yeah. do, do, do you, you know? And I went. And after the first session, the lady said, well, you know, you guys have issues. Obviously, communication was one of them because I shot down. And, um, but Eli, I think you are a case of PTSD. You need to go see a psychiatrist. And I was so insulted that that, Doctor with educational doctrine will tell me that I am, I'm in need of, of, of a shrink. I mean, I mean, I need a psychiatrist. That's mm -hmm. drugs. That's Looney Tunes. That's straight jackets. Yeah. That's not you. Padded room. That's not me. Mm -hmm. And um, I went a couple more sessions and I said, no, I'm not going. And then my wife told me, she goes, okay, if that's the case, I tried. The kids are trying. You're not going. And that's how it's coming, coming across. I agreed to go to a psychiatrist and I went three times. Three times I got there to the door mm -hmm. and about face, you know, walked back into my car, went home. What were you so scared of? Opening up. Yeah. Truth. Yeah. In retrospect, I wasn't scared about that. I was, I thought it was stupid. Yeah, yeah. You were you scared know? of yourself. I was scared of who I'm going to I was scared of who's gonna 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 reflect back from that mirror, mm -hmm. and I don't think I would like that person. But I wasn't ready to let that person go. Mm -hmm. So I met a doctor by the name of Doctor Samani, little Indian guy. <laughs> I'm like I want to eat this guy for lunch, <laughs> and he had me figure it out in like twenty minutes. Wow! So first thing was we have to put you on medication, and he says Eli. You are a severe case of PTSD, and the only reason I'm not classifying it as the highest is because your family are still there. Normally, when the family is leaving, there is bigger tendencies that uh, you're showing. Mm -hmm. So he was saying you could get a little worse. You can get it worse. Yeah. I think medication is going to help you. And I'm like, what kind of medication? So first of all, I needed Trazodone to sleep at night because I wasn't sleeping. Mm -hmm. And ambient, you you growing immune to that. So I was on a high case of of trazodone, and then I had was antidepressant. Um, second thing, he sat down and he said, <clears throat> "Get dressed up," but <clears throat> he said, uh, "I don't think you're no longer fit to be a cop," and I don't think. You should be a cop. 
everything this is your every time you go to work you're just raising the curtain you're putting out an act then he told me the third thing and you have to stop PTSD I'm losing my family cannot be who I am now you want me to give up drinking and be on drinking. I'm like I, I I'm a basket case. I'm going to have to make concessions. So I made concessions. Drinking wasn't one of them. And I said it and, and, and I said it again. Without drinking and without becoming an alcoholic, I would never survive my experience with PTSD. It will mm -hmm. be different between each person. Mm -hmm. But that kept me, that, I, it kept me going. So uh, that's why, yeah. So my two best friends, my first four years in the Marine Corps, we deployed both times together. We went to engineer school together. We went to breacher school together. We did everything together. Um, we got drunk together. We got high together um, on the weekends. Um, they both took their lives. 22. Uh, one in 2018, one in 2020, after we were all out of the service. I have no doubt in my mind at that time, one of those the times I was homeless, but I was on drugs. If I didn't have heroin and, and crack cocaine to keep me, like, at least, it, it was a solution. I don't care what anyone says. It was a solution to what was going on in my head because it could quiet the thoughts. Granted, I lost my family. Granted, I lost my daughter. Granted, I lost my house, right? Because I went to, I chose homelessness. But, like, drugs and alcohol shut down what was going on in my head. Problem was it didn't last, right? And then it would always come back. I never did anything about it. So as the consequences mounted, I, I don't care if I got five seconds of relief from a bag of heroin, I got or or a bottle of booze or or a shot of cocaine. That that was five seconds I couldn't get any other way. Yeah, it, it's, it's and it and it's the only reason I didn't blow my fucking brains out. Yeah, like my two best friends is because of that. So, I took a week off. Called in, I said, "Hey, listen, I I have a family emergency. I need to take a week off." Um. Some people are going to be out there to help you, and some people will be out there to hurt you. Majority of the people will be there to help you. My biggest thing at, at the latter part of my career, I needed to get off the road. I needed to, again, hiding those, those mm -hmm. red flags. I wanted to get promoted, and I took the test several times. And at all times, I finished number one on all times. So I had a chip on my shoulder. Mm -hmm. Also, uh, I had uh, I had uh, my superior in front of the whole in front of the whole squad, my whole my whole uh, platoon uh, at work said, well, "I don't know why you're trying. They don't promote Jews in this place." So after the after the first and second time. I had a conversation, and when the third time happened, I uh, I filed a complaint. I don't know about you, but police work—that's the cardinal sin. Mm -hmm. to, to do that. Yeah, you don't. The guy was a very popular guy, uh, and was was good to me. Early part of my mm -hmm. career, however, I don't think he wanted to to be part of the mm -hmm. like this stuff like being agged on. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, immediately after people will not give you back up because you're a rat. Wow. And, uh, half the people will be politically correct and just do what you say because you're a sergeant. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I didn't even like to be at work. Mm -hmm. I came to the realization that I have PTSD. And after a week, I called my doctor. I said, Hey, do I need to, um, I decide to go and ask for desk duty until we can figure this whole thing out. Maybe I can get better. Mm -hmm. Maybe I can take, you know, yeah. uh, step back and, and heal. heal. He says, yeah, it's, it's not a bad idea. Uh, you guys have an EAP, employee assistant plan. Uh, uh, and I said, oh yeah, absolutely. And as a sergeant, as a supervisor, are they feeding you that? You never go to the police shrink, but if you need it, it's there. I figured 
I'm going to get myself killed. Fine. But I might get somebody else killed. Mm-hmm. Same process. And I, and I went to my, my lieutenant and I told him, I said, uh, I'm just going to talk to the captain. So I talked to the captain. Went to the captain and says, Captain, uh, I got diagnosed with PTSD. It's police related. And I need some time off. I just want to let you know that I won't put myself or the department in a liability. I don't know what's the extent. I didn't even start. Normally, they will start a workers' comp and they will try to get you to talk to their psychologist. Mm-hmm. Um, I was like, hmm, okay. Wait here for a couple of minutes. Left. 20 minutes later, he came back. He goes, okay, I need your badge. I need your gun. I need your department ID. I was wearing uniform. Your uniform. We're gonna give you a ride home. What is happening? Right. You're gonna go on a little vacation. I'm like, okay, that's part of EAP. And memo came in from a chief that I have to report every day, and uh, it's on my own dime, my own vacations, my mm-hmm. own dime. Uh, I was never a- offered any help from the PD when it came to. I was literally the black sheep. Um, now, was that because of that complaint? I think it's, it's a combination. I think it's a combination. I mean, listen, I, I wasn't the easiest guy mm-hmm. to deal with. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, when yeah. when you, you're losing part of your identity yeah. when you're trying to, I'm trying to make you look at me like that, but mm-hmm. I'm sure from this angle, it looks different. And from this angle, it looks different. Mm-hmm. But basically, when you're highly productive, you're dismissing this stuff that you don't have time for like petty stuff that before you just yeah. sat there and just listened to the officer and entertained. you quick to snap. You're quick to dismiss it. Why are you bothering with this nonsense and bullshit? You mm-hmm. know, you're a paid professional. Do I need to come to every, every call and do your job? Literally talking down to people because you have to keep that edge. Um, I was wrong. Yeah. So again, that has nothing to do with the responsibility of the city, but I, I was offered no help, none whatsoever. Um, I was actually told that once I ran out of vacation uh, and sick time, that I'm just not going to get paid. I had to pay them for my medical coverage because I wasn't making any money, so it's not deducting from my, from my paycheck. Check, yeah. I literally had to go into saving and pay for it. Um, I hired an attorney. And uh, the city denied, the pension board denied me. And then we went into arbitration and I won the arbitration, obviously. And August 26th, I'm like, I won. How do you celebrate? Went drinking with my attorney. Yeah. And I was happy go lucky. I was on my boat. And the more I was drinking, then the boat was kind of like, I don't want to be on a boat anymore because it's not fun not being drinking, not drinking on a boat. And the problem with being medicated and still using alcohol is the fact that it's negating your medication. Mm-hmm. So alcohol is a depressant. Heroin is a depressant. <clears throat> Cocaine is a stimulant. So just like a user, you use the the heroin to mellow and just get into your five minutes of, of qualm. Yeah. And then you're like still a little bit groggy. What are you going to do? Take a hit, do yeah. a line of cocaine, and then mm-hmm. you keep on going. Cause now you have energy. Yeah. Same thing with alcohol, but I was tired. Of it. I was tired of it. And my birthday, I decided that today to die. Same plan, the same, everything. Only this time I took four months worth of medication all in one shot. And I was drinking, so my wife took the boys out and they says, we are going to the mall. Uh, when I come back, I don't want to see you, you know, drinking in front of the kids. I felt I accomplished it. She's pushed far away. The only reason she's not leaving me is because now I have PTSD and she feels bad for me. I took the pills and I was kind of successful. She forgot her wallet home. So she had to make a U-turn after 45 minutes. Wow. 
And at that point, I was barely breathing on the floor. I was already bleeding from my nose. You were at that line. I was at that line. Yeah, you're about to uh, pass it. I don't remember nine nine days. <sighs> I was. I woke up at uh, ICU, and uh, I, that's when I broke down. I said, "Yes, you know, it's it's. I I I need more than help." Still did not stop drinking. Yeah. After that, mm -hmm. stopped for a little bit. I controlled it a little bit. The obsession. It's the obsession. Mm -hmm. it's that it's like the high you chase mm -hmm. the, and again by you having a glass of wine normal person is going to have oh my god i'm waiting for my glass of wine for us addicts are uh, we 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 want a glass of wine but that glass of wine just you need two glasses of mm -hmm. wine, and then three glasses of wine, and then a bottle and then two bottles and yeah then you're not using the cup anymore then you're not using the cup anymore mm -hmm. and you start you know Scotch, whiskey, vodka. Okay, you're gonna go to Sam's Club and you're gonna buy that, you know, five gallon one because you're sick and tired of wasting gas and, and money. Mm -hmm. Um until one day I one of my friends came to me and told me, Hey, I quit the quote right now. Quote right now. And I said, You told me I'm sober. I said, What? I never knew that just like you're the most put together person. He goes, Yeah, he goes, I had a bad that experience with uh, alcohol. You know, I was a functioning alcoholic. Mm -hmm. And I told him, I said, you know, I have a friend. Never you. You have a friend. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm calling a, for my friend. <laughs> I have a friend that actually tried to commit suicide. And he's an alcoholic. But he's, you know, going to a meeting, you know, sitting in a circle, you know, hey, my name is and so and I'm an alcoholic. Mm -hmm. uh, not, not him, you know. He says, well, you know, there are meetings which you don't have to stand up, and it's not in a circle, it's in a room. And if you don't want to talk, you don't have to talk. What? Yeah. Okay. My kind of meeting. <laughs> My kind of meeting. 2020. I decided to sit. I'm done. Two years, I cleared my mind. I'm no longer depressed. I'm no longer seeking self harm. Um, I'm going to go to a meeting. COVID. <laughs> Can't go to a meeting. <laughs> Meetings are closed down. I was introduced to Zoom. The beautiful part about Zoom is that if you don't want to be on camera, you don't have to be. You don't have to be on camera. Yeah, it made you so comfortable, right? It gives you the shield. Yeah. It's like people saying, Hey, remember Ricky Williams putting making interviews with his helmet oh, on? No. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 a shield. He he shielded himself from the outside world. And the mm -hmm. same thing is with me. So for the first three months, I did it Eli program. Mm -hmm. I refuse to say I'm in an AA program. Bad label. Yeah. I'm drunk. I'm not an alcoholic. Yeah. Like all those people having drinking problems. Mm -hmm. I have no problem drinking. No, I'm Zero problem. Problem stopping. Yeah. Problem stopping, but <laughs> not talking about people who are drinking. I, I have no problem drinking. And um, after three months, I, I, I spoke up and I remember it's like, I'm like, I, I, that's 90 days. Cause the first time when you're going into, into a program and telling you, you need to attend 90 meetings in 90 days, or at least aim to get close to that. And there is a reason. Repetitiously, they telling you, what needs to be done. And mm -hmm. after three weeks of doing the same exact thing, you start living it. And mm -hmm. after three months, it pretty, become, pretty much becomes a habit. Just like bad habit, you can have good habits. Mm -hmm. And I found out that saying that I'm an alcoholic and then getting a sponsor is actually my, my ticket. And I start liking the new me. Mm -hmm. Then it came to making men. And I'm like, fuck that. I'm not telling anybody I'm sorry. I'm not sorry about anything. Yeah. Tell my wife. Yeah. Tell my kids. My mom passed, so I couldn't tell my mom. Told my dad, told my sisters, my friends. Then I told my neighbor. It becomes easy to say, hey, man, listen, I'm apologizing. I know I, I was wrong. It's not an excuse because you have to have accountability. But this is the reason. Mm -hmm. I hope you will be able to forgive me for what I've done wrong to you. That's all it takes. Mm -hmm. Then my sponsor told me, he goes, you forget one person. So 
go through their list again. They went through the list, more people showing up. So some people are, you can't reach. Some people want nothing to do with you and mm -hmm. you can't blame them once you're sober. You're like, okay, I won't act like that, but I understand. Mm -hmm. And add a couple more lists to the list, batch them off. And then I'm like, God. I know you're missing a person. Like, I know the person. Like, fuck the guy. I'm like, tell me the name. Yeah. Just like, tell me. Yeah. Pulls a mirror. Mm -hmm. He goes, this person. And it didn't hit me until I had to sit with myself sober and realize what I did to myself. Forget about what I did to others. What I did to myself. And the only way to start living again, because you start living. Mm -hmm. 1 through 11, step 1 to 11, you're living. Mm -hmm. The only way to go back to step 1 and know that you did this full circle is to give it back. Yep. Okay. And step 12. And again, I, I'm not a big book thumper and you need to read a chapter and I still go to meetings, but it keeps me grounded and it Places like this, where you have a platform to share with others. That the biggest thing for me was, I'm not unique. I thought, I'm like, poor me. Like, you know what it is to be. I don't know what it is to right. use heroin. Sure. Mm -hmm. I, I, you don't know what it is to wake up in the morning and 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 fix yourself with a full twelve ounces, not coffee, of you know, scotch. Yeah. You know, because you need to get straight. Mm -hmm. And Poor me, it's not my fault, and then it is your fault. You're going through the ups and downs of recovery, and that's where giving back mm -hmm. and seeing somebody else going through it and just putting that virtual arms around them and say, hey, man, you are not alone. Listen. Don't say anything. Just listen. And you see grown men. I mean, you see people that, that you know, working out badasses in the military breaking down and and allowing themselves to breathe honest breath and that's and that's your revelation that's your people ask me do you think it was successful i don't know you don't know yeah. you don't know mm -hmm. i mean nobody knows because yeah. it doesn't have a diet has a beginning and an end right. to a diet mm -hmm. you know a workout program has a beginning and an end. Sobriety doesn't have an end. Right. It ends when, when they're carrying you down to your final quest. And yeah. hopefully then you are at peace. But there is, there is a new lease on life. That's the reason when I, I heard that, oh, you celebrate your sobriety day. And I thought it was so stupid. Mm -hmm. I'm like, what is that? For me, July 5th is... Better than August 5th, which is my birthday. July 5th, I celebrate that. I will go to dinner. I will, I will. My birthday is another. It's a, it's a yeah, day, yeah. you know. You hear yeah. a couple of birthdays having a cake. But for me, July 5th. But the biggest gift of it all is I got to see my kids sober playing football, which I didn't do when they were playing football during mm -hmm. league. Do Pee Wee League, you know. You know and both my kids played in seven years old and then played college. Mm -hmm. I, I got to watch their high school games yeah. sober. Awesome. I got awesome. to watch college games sober. I got to go to graduations. Mm -hmm. I, got, I, I mm -hmm. got to take it all in without a flask, without stopping, without getting my mind altered. I get to sit there at Thanksgiving and yeah. see how dysfunctional my family is. And I love it. <laughs> you know, it's like, instead of saying, oh, I, I need, I need to drink before they coming over. I'm like, I can't wait to see what comes out of this one's mouth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know? Oh yeah. It, it, you're enjoying it. You're yeah. observant. You're more observant. That's great. That's awesome. That really is awesome. How did the bakery come into play? Now you said that that was from your family. My this wasn't a gift of sobriety. It wasn't gifts of sobriety. Okay. My, uh, my, it, it keeps me sane. Mm -hmm. I, I don't, I don't work. I okay. get, I, I retired eventually. I got my pension, mm -hmm. and uh, you have to do something. Yeah. So you can go on a boat so many times, and 
my dad called me one day and says, hey, you know, I need some help in a bakery. Can you come in and help me? And I was completely against. My dad is an old school way of doing things. Yeah. And I am, I'm into the computers and mm-hmm. uh, the, yeah. uh, make my life easy. Yeah. My dad still have a book that he writes down all the expenses. Really? And he oh, does yeah. it every month. It's old and, school, and, and yeah. It's old school. And, I, and I'm like, why do you do this? It's already in a computer. Mm-hmm. But I learned to, no, it's like going back to your military. You learn to shut up and yeah. just, yeah. it works, you don't fix it. Let yeah. him do his thing, you know? Yeah. And um, where is it? It's in Sunrise. We have two locations. We have the store is in Boca on Marina and 441. And we're getting the bread fresh six days a week. Obviously, the Sabbath, we are mm. closed. Uh, and then we have the bakery in Sunrise. My parents opened it with a partner way back when, th- over 30 years ago. And eventually my mom and my dad were working there. And when my mom passed, you know, he had several other uh, mm-hmm. people to help him. The same employees from the day they opened. That's same awesome. bakers. Uh, with my kids' pictures on the back wall, you have the bakers, grandkids, and kids' mm-hmm. pictures. It's, uh, wow. it's, a, it's a pure family. Yeah. That's a so, really, you know, really I'm helping my, thing. I'm helping my dad and yeah. I feed, you know, I, you know, I, I feed the world and I, and I get enjoyment by people enjoying uh hummus and pita and versus, you know, saving oh, yeah. the world one yeah. call at a time, you know? Yeah. There you go. Awesome. Great That's story, really man. Awesome. Yeah. Glad really great glad, story. Glad you're on the side of it, you know? Definitely. It, it's a long road. Yeah. It's, it's not an easy road. It's a long road. And mental health is it's the dagger of them all mm-hmm. you can either push that dagger away mm-hmm. and you can either push it closer to your chest you know i had one of my hostage negotiator um, while i was going through my stuff you know i remember getting a phone call and sarge how are you i'm like you know day by day it's it's, it's, it's gonna it, it, it shall pass mm-hmm. and then two days later she took her own life you know, and I remember being so mad at one of the hearings. I just completely almost flipped the table and I said, You guys much rather see a stat and a, and a plaque on the wall for somebody who took their life than somebody that's actually asking for help. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I figured instead of, instead of being angry about it, sit there and educate. Yeah. You know, that, that's our job is surviving. Shit, that's what I do. My boy, I, I mentioned <clears throat> back picking. And Brandon Lay, those, the two I was talking about, you know, my brother overdosed. I, I mention these people all the time. I got, I'll got, i talk about combat. I know a lot of um, service members don't want to talk about combat. Like, it's like I, I don't know how I'm still alive. But other than to share that experience um, and show others that it's okay, just like you just did. You know what I mean? Um, that I don't know any other way. I don't, I don't think I would be doing my, my job, right? Or my fulfilling my purpose if i didn't like share about that stuff and that's it you know it's, it's a purpose you yeah. have to you have to after you're done and listen everybody everybody that's retiring from the military and everybody's retiring from civil service like police officers that you have to repurpose yourself so when you're knowing many you telling yourself okay i'm done i've done all my I, i've done my best it's a young man's uh young man and young woman's uh uh uh, field we should just move on i should move on you have time to plan but when it's being cut right yeah. there and then and you don't get the traditional send off and mm-hmm. the last call on the radio and uh, and a little plaque and whatever whatever it, it bites you you know and it, it's it's kind of like i you owe that to me mm-hmm. yeah I earned nobody that. owns anything to anybody yeah. you know it's it's that's a resentment, right? It's a, it, it was a resentment. Yeah. And again, until I went through the program, sure. I did not let it go. I mean, right. I wanted my name on that yeah. wall with mm-hmm. everybody else's name because I gave it. I was a perfect officer, but I wasn't a perfect officer at the end. Yeah. You know, I was, I was, yeah. I, it, it's, it, and you know what? And I know what I did and I have my officers of the month and officer of this and that and chief achievements award. And I have all my uniform, my kids one year, two years ago. Shadow boxed my uniform, my class A uniform, and that's awesome. I, I get to see it. Mm-hmm. I know what I have done. Yeah. I twenty years from today, the new officers will walk that 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 
you know, the briefing room, mm -hmm. you know, look at that big black board. Then you're going to say, oh, man, that Eli Vidal. And chances are they won't know who Eli Vidal was mm -hmm. or Sarge was or, you know, it, people don't know who yeah. was the president, you know, 20 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. They, let they alone 10 they years ago. Yeah. They, won't, they won't know who, who mm -hmm. I am. And, I, and that was the beginning of the rationale. And then it was, did you think I did good? Me, to myself. Do I think I did good? Yes. Would I change a lot of things? Absolutely. That's part of growth. That's part of the recovery. Where when you're not in recovery, uh, it's hard for you to make that distinguish. Mm -hmm. And another thing I keep saying to, I told to my kid the other day, he goes, Dad, what's the best thing that recovery gave you? And I said, the three seconds. He goes, three seconds. I said, the three seconds filter to know what comes out of your mouth. He goes, when you are, when you are on, when you are high or you are drunk, you know, everything goes. The next day you're asking your partner, okay, why did I say, who did I offend? You know, who should I avoid? What, yeah. what, what floor in the building should I avoid? Mm -hmm. you know, where they, you're going, you, you know what you've said. And I always said it. If you're an asshole, you're going to be a drunk asshole. You're going to be a sober asshole. Mm -hmm. At least when you're a sober asshole, you know you're an asshole. Mm -hmm. right. you, know, you don't have any, any excuses. <laughs> and, I like that's that. the way, yeah. and, and that's the way it is it's your mm -hmm. personality you have three seconds to filter what you're saying and, yeah. and that and that's a gift not a lot of people who who we know have that gift no. just, do skill. i want to be there i don't want to yeah. yeah. let it go mm -hmm. yeah it's part of the 10 step right pause yeah yeah pause it's pause god i'd say god lives in that pause mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what i mean because I don't pause. Yeah. Yeah. Look, man, it's been great. I appreciate you coming back. Thank you guys. Need. Yeah. Thank, thank you so, so guys. much. Yeah. Thank you guys. Absolutely. Sure. I appreciate now, Sarge, it. if there was anything that you could tell somebody like an early recovery, like something that would be really important or something that might, you know, change the way that they look at it. Anything? I'm going to use the biggest cliche in every meeting. I love it. And that's one day at a time. That's it. And if it's too much, go one hour at a time, you know? And always when you're getting into your tangent of thinking that I want to reach or I, I want to use, call your sponsor. You're going to use, you're going to use. Mm -hmm. Call your sponsor. That's, that's the most important thing. And as a sponsor, I always tell people, look down. Your head is already down. Look down. What do you see? Your two feet. That's where you are. You're not there. You're not behind. You're right there. You're right now. So. You can reset the clock right now, or you can walk away, take a walk, do something else, and continue that clock. One day at a time. Nobody, the record is 24 hours. Nobody was sober more than 24 hours. Mm -hmm. It's just a string of 24 hours, but it's 24 hours. And it becomes a week, it becomes a month, it becomes a year, and then it becomes hopefully decades. And it, it's a string of 24 hours. No, no, nobody did a 30 year career in the military at boot camp. Yeah. You know, it, For sure. you have to go one day at a time. Mm -hmm. That's what I tell everybody. That's awesome. Thank you. Appreciate you guys. All right. Yeah, absolutely. Listen, thank you guys, you know, for tuning in. If you want to give us a follow, Instagram, Facebook, subscribe on YouTube, keep up to date with everything that we have going on. Uh, you know, this, um, this is really important for all of us. I know it's important for you. So, you want to keep up to date you know make sure you hit that follow like and subscribe button and check out pita pan bakery in boca you know we've got some great stuff um you know maybe we'll uh we'll pin the address or link the address somewhere in the comments uh again thank you guys for tuning in boom, boom, boom.